Well, there we are. Hello, everyone. This is Ms. Johnson. I am one of the proud NC Ties board members, and I am here with Ms. Christine Barbero. She is a representative from NCDPI. She represents the virtual schools, um, and she's going to be sharing with us how to empower novice educators with rethink education content. So I will yield the floor to you. Wonderful. Well, I am um, glad to share all about our content. Um, we have um, uh, so many exciting things to share with you guys today. And all of this information is accessible using the bit.ly link that you see, see on this slide or the QR code. So if you're watching this as a recording, feel free to pause the video now so you can get the bit, bit.ly um, or you can scan the QR code because all of the resources that I'm going to share with you today, um, you can find um, uh, there in the slide deck. Um, thank you, Ms. Johnson, for introducing me. I've had the privilege of getting to work with her with Cumberland Virtual Academy, but um, I work for woo -woo, Cumberland. Uh, I work for uh, DPI, as she mentioned, as part of the Office of Virtual Instruction Support Services. Um, we have um, hosted four cohorts of blended learning over the last three and a half years, where we have trained about 2,000 educators across the state, including Ms. Johnson, um, in the concepts of blended learning, allowing them to train folks back in their districts. We um, have also supported the remote academies. Currently, we have 39 re remote academies around the state. Um, I support the Southwest and the Sand Hills region of the state, but I also act as our division's operations manager. So I'm excited to be here today. If you are watching this video or you're here today and you're in a different area of the state, this is our team as well as all of their contact information. So please feel free to reach out to anybody on our team if you are in a different region, if you would like more information or you'd like more support. Um, today, um, we are really going to be digging into the Rethink content. When Rethink began, which the Office of Virtual Instruction Support now runs. It was a US Department of Ed grant funded initiative that was focused on taking the lessons from the pandemic and using those to drive instruction forward in North Carolina. So one of the components of the grant was to have completely free, always completely free, uh, K-8 content in ELA, social studies, science, and math, so that we could have resources that educators could have access to that were high quality standards-based resources. So today's session is going to focus on you being a learner, being able to use our resources to design learning, and also to facilitate learning for other people. Um, so those are the DLCs that we're focusing on today. There's a couple of outcomes that we hope you take away from the session today. Um, the first is that you understand how the content was developed. We want you to look at some small group instructional methods um, using the Rethink Ed um, content, and we're going to give you some sample lesson plans. So that is great. Now, because of the session today, um, we had a couple of little snafus, but we want to um, get things started. We are going to be using a Padlet today um, that is going to give us the opportunity um, to get to know each other a little bit and answer answer some questions in that format. So um, I will drop the link for the Padlet into the chat. Um, and if you are joining us um, through video, feel free to um, click on this and see what people may have shared. Um, so since right now, Ms. Johnson and I are the only ones that are able to speak because of the webinar format, um, I thought it would be fun just to start off with and to take a look at these questions. So there's a couple of questions pinned in the Padlet. Um, and so, uh, Ms. Johnson, is there one of these questions that you would be willing to answer and then I'll answer one? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, Oh, if you could magically have any job in the world, what would it be? Or what job would you want? Um, here lately, I have really thought about if I wasn't in like this sector of education, what would I do? And I have really thought about like educational law oh. or being like a civil rights attorney. So oh. I think that's like, that's what I would do. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, you would be great at that. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I would love that. That's so cool. Um, 
I was thinking more silly, which was uh, what's the worst style choice that you've ever made in your life? Well, let me just tell you, I grew up in eight in the eighties in Texas. So let me tell you how big my hair was. Aquanet, a hair, hair dryer, huge curlers. So I had some serious. You had serious. the Peggy Bundy. <laughs> oh yes. 1980s uh, Texas uh, hair. So that was no joke right there. All right. Well, we're going to be coming back to the Padlet throughout to ask ourselves a couple of reflection questions about some of the things that we're looking at today. Um, thank you, Ms. Johnson, for being willing to jump in there and answer. I can't wait to see when you become an educational civil rights lawyer. That's fabulous. Um, if you are unfamiliar with blended learning, um, I wanted to make sure that I showed you what we use as a reference to blended learning. Our um, uh, division developed this concept, which is based on a book called Blended by Staker and Horn. Um, we talk about four models of blended learning. So they range from the rotation model, which starts in the fully face-to-face -face brick and mortar school building. And it goes all the way over to the lab model, which is set in the um, fully virtual environment, like Ms. Me. Johnson said. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, so there are different ways that it can be incorporated. And so this um, spectrum shows you that you could start with something like the rotation model, which might include in-class flips or station rotations. You might consider the flex model, which might include things like playlists or allowing students to have more flexibility in their choice of what they take or when they take it. The blend model is the combination of having students in front of you with students in an offset location. And we're seeing a lot of this right now across the state with teacher shortages. So we do have a good number of high school educators that are teaching a course to kids sitting in front of them and also another group of kids that maybe don't have a teacher. Um, and then the lab model, that fully virtual model. And like I said, we actually have 39 remote academies across the state, but we also have thousands and thousands of students in virtual programs where the district has district level educators that are providing typically high school courses um, fully virtually to those students, but they're still enrolled in their home school. So mm -hmm. virtual learning is a part of the state and has been um, long before the pandemic, and we hope it continues that way moving past the pandemic. So um, many people have a lot of misperceptions about blended learning, and oftentimes people are confused about what we mean, and people often remember the pandemic and that emergency room yeah. teaching, and they kind of panic. Um, and so what we want to do is make sure you understand that it is much more than that. Um, so blended learning combines the best of online with the best of face-to-face -face learning. It can be done in any setting. It involves multiple modality. Another big misperception is that people think we're saying to put kids on computers or on technology. And it is multiple modality. Kids mm -hmm. should be doing collaborative activities. Kids should be working in partners. Kids should be doing independent work. Mm -hmm. Kids should be mm -hmm. in small group instruction, um, in whole group instruction. So it's multiple modality. Um, and one of the big hallmarks of blended learning is that it gives students ownership over their own learning. And a common concern that we are seeing across the state right now in really all grade spans is a lack of um, interest and engagement from students. There's a real apathy. And so one of the reasons that that can be happening, there's many factors to it, but one of them is that sometimes when kids don't feel ownership or agency over what they're learning, they tend to kind of shut down. So I'm gonna show a quick video. Um, this is a cohort three badged facilitator um, named Dan Coleman. He works up in Asheville City Schools and we're sending lots of thoughts up there that way. Um, but Dan shared in a podcast episode where we interviewed him about how he was implementing blended learning in his math classroom after being in the cohort. And so as you're hearing this, I want you to think about what is it you hear that maybe is a question you have or a takeaway from the video? And then Ms. Johnson, you and I can maybe share any takeaways or um, questions that we have after watching it. So I'm gonna briefly show us this video. Curious though, what specifically did you do to implement those stations to make them so successful? Because it all sounds almost too good to be true. Um, so when you say, hey, I did all this great stuff, like what is the first step that you took in order to make your station so successful at the high school level? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, by all means, like as much as I'm singing the praises, I should clarify, like it was not perfect at first by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, after just kind of toying with really just kind of a basic, like I'm going to do a teacher led station, I'm going to do a hands on station, we're going to do like a digital station for independent practice, and then like a group workstation. Um, you know, once I kind of saw it in action, I could start to see where some some things could kind of fall off the rails a little bit. So really what was most successful for me was to really kind of first sit down and be intentional about what I want to accomplish. And so for me, it really became kind of like a, a braided concept of sorts of like, I have my core learning target for the lesson. You know, that's the, you know, the main thing that we're trying to target, but then also wanting to kind of like look back to doing spiraled review, um, especially in math one, you know, where we are beholden to a state exam. And I know that the students need to see these things on a regular basis, or they're going to just fall out of memory. Um, but then also wanting to have some spaces where I could just let students explore you know, give, you know, create some space and time for those things that, especially in a standardized test-based course, often just end up getting kind of pushed to the back burner because you're so pressed for time to be able to hit all of those standards. And so then I started trying to kind of think about that against where I had students at. So like in terms of, you know, where are my struggling students who really need a pretty high degree of support to get to target? Who are my students who are able to usually hit the target pretty successfully? You just need a little kind of coaching and guidance. And then usually I have a handful of students, particularly based on the our population at our school, that are exceptionally strong learners that honestly, I'm just kind of here to point them in the right direction. Um, and, and so once I was able to kind of recognize both my goals and the population that I was working with, then I could kind of start envisioning what I wanted, like all the different rotations to look like. And so once I was able to kind of parse all that out in my head, then I could sort of sit down, of course, me math teacher, very like matrix based thinking here. <laughs> Of like, okay, I've got X number of groups and Y number of activities, and now i got to figure out where we're going to shuffle them all to and how. Um, and so, you know, once I had that framework in mind, the process of being able to then plug in a specific activity of, okay, if I'm looking for these students to review these topics, I've got a great Desmos activity for that. Let's plug that in right here. Um, you, you know, a lot of that process just seems to kind of weave together to create a much more cohesive experience that isn't just, here's the skill, drill it, kill it. Here's the next skill, drill it, kill it. So on and so on, follow it by a quiz, do it a few more times, follow it by a test, lather, rinse, repeat. All right. Well, um, did you have anything jump out at you that he shared in that video that spoke to you? I think naturally, you know, because he's a tested subject and he's saying math, I'm really just curious on how he provided students like real world opportunities while still um, staying focused. You know, he's he's tested. So how did you right. combine those two things together? Yeah, one of the things that he says in this episode, which is not out yet, this is a, a sneak peek, um, is that because he was doing small group instruction as the primary form of instruction, he was moving kids faster than he ever had before through the pacing guide. Because mm. in small groups, he could see where kids were struggling. He could figure out how to help them as they were moving. And it was much easier to keep them going. So what happened is instead of spending his instructional time up in front of the class, whole group talking 
talking to everyone and then having about 50% of the kids not willing to raise their hand, not willing to admit that they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Now in small groups, he could be really working with them. And then mm. the real world was a station. So for kids that were able to get to that extension work, they were able to do that, but not miss Got out it. the instruction. So it really just allowed him to be able to fit in both. And he describes it as transformative, you know, the way that he was able to get to kids in a way that he had never in all of his years of teaching been able to impact change. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's major because mm -hmm. I know at secondary, I often hear small groups in elementary, yep. but they don't, we don't talk about small groups when we talk about secondary and up. You know. Absolutely. And in fact, that's something our division is doing a lot of with blended learning is talking about the place that secondary has, because a lot of the apathy and engagement issues we're seeing are in middle school, high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of it is just shifting the way we approach things. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's great. One of the things I love about Dan is that he really talked about this combination of standards based being the start, but matching it to the kids in front of them and then really mm -hmm. weaving it together in kind of a braid of all those pieces being thoughtfully um, put out. I think one of the things that we hope you take away from listening to someone like Dan, no matter what grade level you're in, is that we really want you to see that blended learning as an instructional structure can often solve a lot of problems that educators are having, including our novice educators. Um, and I'm sure you guys know um, at Cumberland Virtual, but across the state, we have the largest number of novice educators that we've ever had. Not only our BTs, so we've got lots of... Um, um, uh, beginning teachers across the state, BT ones, twos, or threes. We also have a really large number of international educators who in their native countries may be really uh, expert educators, but when they come to America, they have to learn the standards here in North Carolina. So they are novice in the sense that they are new to the North Carolina standards and the American school system. And then we have a lot of educators that are lateral entry or alternative licensure. So those also fall under this category because they are coming in from a different field field or from a different career. So when we talk about blended learning, it has the power to empower and support these educators as well as all educators. Now, one of the reasons that we hope you'll leave today with some thoughts about how you might either infuse your own instruction if you are one of those novice educator groups that we mentioned, or if you're someone who supports those novice educator groups, one of the things that we hope you will get out of this is that our content can be the first step into implementing some blended learning, but also into giving yourself high quality standards-based content that might impact change in those classrooms. So there's a lot of things that are really important about supporting our novice educators. Um, some of the benefits about providing them with our content is that right out of the gate, and we're going to look at it in just a minute, it is high quality, completely free, standards aligned curric curriculum that is ready to use. So it is open, ready. You just can literally download it from Canvas. If you're not in a district that uses Canvas as your LMS, we have it available in shared Google folders um, and Google Drives that you can have access to, but you don't have to do anything to use it. It is ready for you. Um, one of the things that I think is great, I go back to my first year teaching 174 years ago, and um, my husband was on the team. I met him teaching fifth grade. And one of the things that he said to me that first year when I was struggling to just figure out what in the world was I supposed to teach was he said, take every test that you give the kids so you learn the standards, so you figure out what you're supposed to be teaching. Our content can be used by educators who are new to teaching, new to our country, um, to be able to learn the standards themselves. They can go through the modules, they can look at the content that's in there and get a sense of the rigor, the depth, what it's going to look like in a tested area. Um, so that can be a really big benefit that oftentimes I don't think we talk about enough for our novice teachers. Um, all of our content is meant to be used in um, any setting. Um, and um, there is um, accessibility and differentiation built right in. All of this is copyright accessible and common use. And we have some really great supplemental tools that really support family engagement. Um, we have I'm a visitor. In oh. the chat, um, Ms. Christy Hollis with us. Hey, Ms. Christy, she is asking, could you please share the link for the presentation? 
I sure will. I'm going to go back. We're so glad to have you, Christy. I'm going to go ahead and copy the link address for you and drop it into the chat. Welcome, welcome. There it is right there. We're so glad you could join us. I hope your day has not been too wild. Um, so we um, are really moving into looking at the content. So Christy, you've arrived at a great time um, because we're really talking about how the Rethink Education K-8 content can be used to support novice educators. Just as a recap, we're referencing novice educators as not only our beginning teachers, our beginning one, two, or three teachers, but also our lateral and alternative licensed teachers and our international educators who may be experts in their own native country but coming here, having to learn the American school system, as well as the North Carolina standards, they may need some additional supports. So that is what we're talking about today. And we started by talking a little bit about blended learning, which is part of the mission of our division. So we're going to get into it now, and we are going to look at the content. Um, so to begin, I am going to drop the link into this document. This is called the Available Content Document, and this is where everything is housed. It is like your treasure trove of material. Um, so I'm going to just show you um, how you would access this so that you can know what's on here. But then we're going to have some time where everyone's going to be able to look around at some of the components. And then we are going to look at it from the lens of how you might incorporate stations at any level, elementary, late elementary, middle or high. So this document is um, the available content document. It is always updated in real time if there is anything new um, that gets done to the content. Um, you can see that it is set up by grade span and content area. So third through eighth grade is all up here starting at the top. There is a Canvas Commons link. That is really, if you are in a district that uses Canvas as the LMS, that is the easiest way to access the content because you can literally go create a sandbox course, download the whole content into your sandbox course, and then just pull over any parts of it that you like. Um, if you are not in a Canvas district, I'll show you in just a minute the easiest way to access the shared Google Drives. So um, you can see that we have a link for non-Canvas. We have a link for those of you in Canvas. We also are going to talk about these additional resources, which are phenomenal. We offer parent guides for every single content area and for every single grade level, and they are in five languages, English and a multitude of other languages. They are my absolute favorite part of the content, and I think they could be used not only with parents and families, but also with students. So if you have multilingual learner students who might speak a different language, you may want to consider the parent guides as a support tool, and I'll show you why in a minute. We also offer a teacher's guide that has all of the differentiation already built in. And then for PLC and planning, we offer a full course outline with the standards that can be used so that you can talk about this when you're in your PLCs or PLTs to really build up and develop. So all starting at the top, this is our third through eighth grade with all of those resources for ELA, math, social studies, and science. For math and science, some of the um, modules that are in Canvas have been pulled out by a content-specific standard. So if you don't want to download the whole content, um, but you want to just download a specific standard or you want to look at it, this has got the same material there. Um, then if you continue to scroll down past all of those, you get into our K-2 resources. So um, our kindergarten, first and second grade are all done in units and they are all done in Google Slides so that they're extremely accessible if a student is accessing them on an LMS system like Seesaw or if you are using an iPad. They're just very designed for um, younger students to be able to access so these are all of the different content areas. We have an amazing content development lead named Kelly Ralston, and she is a rock star. And after we went to NC Bold last year, she actually felt like we needed to redo the format. And so now kindergarten is not done yet, but first and second grade are done. So for each subject area, all of the units and all the corresponding materials are now just on one PDF document. So that is awesome. It's really great. And these are designed to be developmentally appropriate um, and they're really high quality content. 
Then at the very bottom of the document, you will see this is where all of our shared Google Drives are. So if you are not in a system that uses Canvas as their LMS, you can go down here to the bottom of the document and then you can pull up the shared Google Drives and you will be able to access all of the content in that format. Does anybody have any questions about that um, available content document? All right, well, um, I do want to introduce you to some of the support materials that go along that you can access within the available content document that I just showed you. As I mentioned before, the parent guides are my personal favorite thing. So I've put an example here and if you click on it, you can see this link, which I will also drop into the chat for you. Um, there are several things that I love about the parent con content guides and I think could be so helpful for our novice educators. So because ELA was my subject area and I'm going to take fifth grade, you can see that all of the parent guides are in five languages, English, Arabic, Hindi, Spanish, and Vietnamese. I'm going to open the English one so you get a chance to see what's in there. The first thing in every content area in the parent guides is um, the standards in parent-friendly language, language that a parent could understand. Then my very favorite part is the content specific vocabulary. And when I say all of the content specific vocabulary, I mean all, it goes on for pages and pages and it gives a picture, a definition and the word itself. Um, and this is the piece that I might use with a multilingual learner student, because if you have someone that speaks Spanish of the native language, drop the parent guide that's in Spanish into your LMS system. And now they can access their content specific vocabulary in their native language and compare it to the English version. It's a great vocabulary builder. Um, so I personally love this. I would also use this probably with all my students because I think the vocabulary is so great. That's what um, I was yeah. thinking about, like making sure that everyone has the same definitions for a lot of the um, academic vocabulary. Right. And particularly when you get into subjects like span, uh, like um, science and um, math, where you've got to know those terms, you know, they're very specific. I agree. I feel like this is like to me, I would be using the parent guides everywhere. One thing we love about our content is it's designed for y'all to use. So there are no rules. If you want to take it and cut out and just have the vocabulary, whatever it is, you can make it work for you. So it is North Carolina educators content. So please feel free to do with it what you need to. Um, there is also um, examples of what testing might look like for that child. Um, they give the parents some free online resources. They also give some at-home connections. I love these because these are questions parents can ask their kids. They're activities that parents can do in science. So there's a lot of really great material within there. They also talk about challenges and ways to communicate with the child's teachers. So the parent guides, I just, they are my very favorite component. Um, there is also a teacher's guide um, and I just pulled out um, here, you can see they're right in the available content document, but they offer the full differentiation. So they give you supports for each lesson in the modules on EC students with AIG or gifted students, if you've got multilingual learners, visual or hearing impaired. So this is a great resource for you. Um, and then, I already showed you what it looks like when all of our content is on one PDF. Right now, because of the situation in Western North Carolina, our division is developing um, what we're calling the first two week back lesson plans. And so we are developing lesson plans using our content that could be used for someone if they are just returning to school. But I thought it might be helpful because it's a great way to see what is in our content. So if you are interested in kind of just getting a bird's eye view of this is a sixth grade math um, set of skills, it goes through and it gives you all the things that you would find if you are in the content itself. So I thought that would be a good overview. Now, we are sharing with you, um, and we're running tight on time, but we are sharing with you um, a format called horizontal planning. And it is a way to move away from doing what we call a vertical lesson, where it's like, I do a mini lesson, I pull my kids into independent practice, we do a little guided work together, now we might do some independent work. 
Um, and instead, think of them in being in those stations that we talked about at the beginning of the session. Um, so it moves those same activities, but it just spreads them out across different activities and centers or stations. Um, we have created several different versions of this horizontal planning. Um, and so in here, we give you the support document from our content. We give you the standards, and then we literally tell you exactly what you can pull out of our content to have four different stations. And you can see here, there's a teacher-led station, an online station, an enrichment or extension station, and an offline station. Because one of the things we want to emphasize is that multiple modality, that we do not have kids sitting on computers or only doing computer-based work. Um, these stations can absolutely be modified if you're in a fully vir virtual setting, um, and we have lots of resources that we can use to support with that. So what I'd like to do is let you take just a few minutes. Right now it's 4.33, so I'm just going to give you five minutes. And if everybody would like to explore, on this slide, we've given you a second grade station rotation lesson, a fifth grade one, and an eighth grade one, all are science. Then we've given you some additional resources down here that you could look at. And then we have some additional resources on this slide that you might be interested in looking at. We have our accessibility dashboard, our digital tool dashboard. We have a YouTube playlist. We have our podcast. And then because the science standards are changing, um, we have created um, a, a update document because it will tell you what to add in or where to find a standard that moved grade levels. So those are there to support the science. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is let everyone have just a few minutes to be able to explore these um, lesson plans that are on this slide, as well as the information on the next slide. But during this time, I'd like it, it's a small group that's in here today, I'd like it just to be an open forum. So if you see something and you wanna say it in the chat, or you wanna ask a question, um, Ms. Johnson, if there's something you're noticing, um, I wanna open the floor so if people want to be able to share as we're looking through things, you can. So I'm gonna give everybody about five minutes. I've already noticed that you guys have done a lot of updating since I've went through the uh, rethink training. <laughs> yes, it's amazing. And you know, when you went through, not all of the content was even done. Not all of mm -hmm. the parent guides have been translated into multiple languages. So there's so much. And then we're trying to create interactive documents like these that are pulling the content out. Because one thing I feel like when you look at it in Canvas, there is so much, it's almost too much. So with our novice educators, we're trying to give you examples of the way you could pull things out for them and help them have something for them to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot has been done. <laughs> and Miss Hall, if you have anything that you want to ask or anything you want to share, let me know. I'm really excited about the idea of the small groups. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that we have been trying at my my school for a very long time and being virtual has been difficult. So I think that this could be game changing. Absolutely. Um, and that has been kind of a new thing um, that we've really been hearing across the state is how many secondary educators really need something that could change the lack of engagement, the apathy, that. And so um, if you are interested in getting support, I'm, I speak to you, Ms. Johnson, because I work with you guys and I love you guys. Mm -hmm. But across the state, um, I will just show um, uh, here on slide three, all across the state, there are my counterparts. We can provide PD to you either in person or virtually on how to implement station rotation in secondary, whether that be a face-to-face. -face. I just did this for a high school and, and did a training with all of their high school staff or fully virtual or some combination in between. So if you are interested in knowing more about that, I think it's something we need to see. Um, it's been a very challenging years uh, for a lot of the secondary educators, particularly middle school, which I think is really struggling. So we want to be a support and a resource for that. One thing I love as you're looking through things is just that there's so many support pieces. So when we talk about our novice educators, when we talk about any educators, but with our novice educators, 
if you're someone who supports new educators, you could pull out things that you think would be beneficial. Oh, you're not 100% sure on the content vocabulary? Here, let me pull out the parent guide and let's go through it together. Or, oh, you need to teach this upcoming module? Hey, in our PLC, let's get together and let's look through the module together. Um, we want you to think of our content as content that can meet specific needs. It is not meant that you have to open it and start at day one and go through. So please pull out the pieces that you're interested in and know that we can provide professional development if you need support. This is just kind of like glossing over the service surface. So if there is more that you would like, please let us know. All right, we are running out of time. So um, Miss Hall, I know you're there. Is there anything in the chat you want to ask before we kind of bebop forward? All right. Well, one of the things that we want to end with um, is the idea that education's in a lot of flux. It's in change all across the United States. It's in change here in North Carolina. And one of the things we hope that every educator hears is how valuable you are. Every single day, no matter how challenging it might be, you are making a difference for kids um, and really moving the dial. But changing and moving ourselves forward into new and different ways. So when we take the example of maybe putting stations into secondary or maybe trying to implement some sort of a blended model that doesn't use as much direct instruction, it's really important that you are allow yourself to be in the growth mindset. If you're a novice educator, please hear. Every person here was a novice educator and I can tell you stories of the things I did mm -hmm. that I would never do again. <laughs> So, I mean, seriously, we have all been there. So keeping a growth mindset and not letting yourself get frustrated if a lesson bombs or kids don't respond a certain way, it's okay. And so one of the things that we want you to do is really stay focused. Yeah, grace is so important, is stay focused on that growth mindset. So this is a really sweet little video that basically just reemphasizes this. And as it's playing, I want you to think about what you've seen here today and what your first next step might be to help support novice educators that you work with or to support yourself as a novice educator, or if you're none of those things, just how might you continue to move the dial forward? So I'm going to show this and that will be where we'll end today. Okay, that should do it. So exciting. Play, Uncle Joe can't hold on much longer. Everybody ready? Go, Carl. <laughs> Oh no. No. I didn't know. But I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You failed. It was awesome. Exceptional. Standing. From failing, you learn. From success, not so much. I gave up every time I failed. I never would have made the meatball cannon. I never would have made my fireproof pants. Ah, uh, still working out the kinks. Like my husband always says. I propose a toast to Lewis and his brilliant failure. May it lead to success in the future. All right. Well, that video is very sweet, but we do hope you know that um, being an educator is both the most rewarding and the most challenging profession in the world. Um, if you are new to the profession here in North Carolina or you are someone who's been around a while, we hope that you keep that growth mindset in place. We hope that our content can be a resource that can help make your job easier and that you really innovate in the way you might consider using it. And so we hope that right now, whether you're watching this video or if you're in the live session with us, that you take a moment to reflect on what is your first thing you wanna do based on what you've heard here today. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. You were great as we tried to figure out what we were doing. Um, and so um, just appreciate everyone taking some time at the end of a busy school day. So thank, thank you so much. I definitely will be in touch.
<laughs> Lots of great ideas. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Ms. Hall is still with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, NC Ties, thanks you. And I hope everyone found some great materials, um, not just virtual schools, but all schools. Um, Ms. Barbario, you're awesome as always. And I'll, everyone have a great rest of your day. Take so care, long. everybody.